16th, 2019. Of course, it is depending on where you live, whether it's the 16th or 17th. Huh. <laughs> um, but right now we're going to go with uh, the 16th so people just don't get confused. Um, I have a really cool guest for you tonight, and his name is Jay Izzo. He's a social media expert, author, speaker. Uh, he's also a host. He's got a really great radio voice, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, who is this person, you ask? Okay. Now, in a world now unindated with anonymous virile from social media and anonymous politics from what should be objective news sources, there's a social wound that needs to be healed. Jay Izzo has taught psychology at several universities, made sense of social media for business, coach coaches, athletes, and administrators, and avoiding DFMD, digital foot and mouth disease, which I have to say we have all been there, right? <laughs> yeah, we've all been there, for sure. A few times, if we're really honest. <laughs> Now, turning back to his decade of experience as a farmhand in Nebraska, Jay now applies these lessons to business and to life. These lessons precede social media and will hold firm despite the media madness and social silliness from college campuses to Wall Street and everywhere in between. Jay Izzo is a psychological business consultant, social mediologist, I've never heard that one before. Yeah. Well, Speaker and writer inspires coaches, athletes, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and individuals through inspirational speaking. And as an author, Jay is in the business of helping people to maximize their potential by moving forward from today's version of themselves towards their goals by making baby steps in the right direction. Wow. Okay. Now, do you want to explain what you do? <laughs> you know what? I just help people. I help people find a new direction in their life, their career, or their business. And I just try to help people be a little bit better than they are right now at this very moment. I just want them to be a little bit better. And so that's it. That's really it in a nutshell. And so I've I've written several books from life lessons, leadership lessons on the farm, which is the most recent book, to helping people in online digital environments improve themselves, whether it's uh, personally or professionally. You still live on the farm? No, no. You know, I'm a. I I don't, but man, I miss those lessons. I really do. I I loved being on the farm. I, I really. I was a farm hand, so I was in a town of 119 people in Nebraska, and I was a farm hand. So my parents were from New Jersey, <laughs> and they moved to Nebraska. People ask me why did they move? For, why did they move to Nebraska? I say witness protection. I don't think that's true, but it's what I usually typically say. But, uh, you know, the truth is they moved to Nebraska. They wanted to be raised out in the Midwest. And uh, so as a baby, I was there. And the next thing you know, you're thrown into the back of a pickup truck when you're 9 or 10 years old. And the next thing you're learning about farming. And uh, that was great. And I learned. The, the, I had great mentors. Really did. I, I'm from Michigan. You know, I did my summers in the Upper Peninsula and hung out with the farms. But, you know, I honor farmers and people who do that because you're really closer to the land. You know, I tell people it's a very spiritual experience. You know, my One of my best friends that I, I grew up with back in Nebraska, his name is Russell, and we've known each other for 50 years. And you know, we talk about that we've dropped our blood and our sweat in the land and that the land is, a, is very much a part of who we are and still is a part of who I am. Because it, it, is a, it is a very spiritual experience. You know, we, we planted things and we didn't, you can't see things grow, but you have to have faith that they do grow. And, you know, those are part of the things in life is that, you know, you can't always see what the seed actually does. You can't see the seed break down. You can't see the seed germinate. You can't see all those things and you can't see how the soil and the water and Everything else plays a role in that. So you live by faith quite frequently in that environment. And so it is a very spiritual thing. And then, you know, of course, you're out in your nature, you know. And, and in Nebraska, like in Michigan, you know this, you've got four seasons, you know, not like we do in Hawaii and North Carolina. So 
um, you, you experience a different spiritual awakening, I think, in all four of those seasons that maybe you don't do when we live in a climate that's pretty moderate or temperate. So I take it you don't plant your seeds and say, may the strong survive? <laughs> you know, I... I think I don't think I do that. I think what it is is I plant my seeds and recognize that there are things that I have to do to make the seed grow. And I and you know I um, apply this to life all the time. And I tell people, you know, your words are seeds, and our words are seeds. And if you want those seeds to grow, that means we have to invest time in people, and and that means that we have to take those words, and then we can't just say them. Now we have to follow them up with some sort of an action. And so that action is like the sun and the water and the fertilizer that they need to help those seeds as well as grow into other people's lives. So I'm, I'm really, I really am a firm believer that you just don't plant the seed and let the strongest survive. I'm a firm believer that you plant the seed and then you have to do other things. You have to take action in order to make those things grow so that you have the most healthy plant in the world. That's true. Um, I, on the other hand, went out and bought flowers, you know, wildflowers, 30,000 seeds for a hundred square feet. And I'm one, you know, may the strong live and, you know, good luck guys. Okay. Right. Every one of the seeds came up in a 10 by 10 garden. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, little crowded. Was it a little crowded, Kathy? Well, it is, but I'm really excited because every day, you know, a new flower comes out and, right. you know, it, it's so beautiful and it's like, oh my God, you know, thank you. <laughs> you're alive and you're beautiful and look what you've added. But yeah. isn't that what we do with people though? I mean, I think if we thought about that in terms of people, right? Like we plant seeds in people's lives and if we nurture them in those people's lives, right? we get to see some really beautiful things in those people. And I think, you know, when I wrote this book and I was applying these lessons to life and, you know, I consult businesses and, and coach people, I really find that when I'm really planting those seeds into their soil, their heart or their mind or their soul, whenever I'm doing in that, you know, I try to take as much responsibility as I can. I understand that they have to do some work too, but you know, I find it just a beautiful thing when you start to see somebody blossom who all of a sudden has this awakening of like going, oh, man, I am far better than I think I am. Or I can do far more than I think I can do. Or, you know, life is far better than I think it is. Or I am I can be grateful regardless of what the circumstances are. I think, you know, we underestimate I, this is why I love the farm and why I love what you said about planting, because. Here you've planted all these seeds and they're growing, and now what you have is you have this beautiful garden, and every day you go, wow, they're so beautiful. And I believe we do that with people, and I, and I really do. I believe that our words and our actions do that with people, and, and that excites me every day that I get that opportunity. Lovely. Well put. I kind of liken it to the parents recognizing a child's gifts and allowing them to develop. <sighs> Yeah, right. Right. You gotta you gotta know what your child's bent is. I think the I think sometimes parents make a mistake. You know, they hear that old proverb of you know train a child in the way they should go and they will not depart from it. I think they make a mistake though because I think they misread it, thinking that they're trying to raise the child in the way the parent wants them to go. But that's not really the proverb. The proverb really is understand what your bent is for the child. And then train that child in whatever that bent is. So if your child is more uh, musically inclined, well, then do whatever you got to do to feed that bent in music. If your child is more hands-on, well, then do whatever you got to do to do the hands-on. If, if your child's more scientific, well, then do what you need to do to grow the science. If your child is more verbal, then do what you need to do to do more things in the verbal realm. And I think that's the mistake that the parent that sometimes we make as parents, because I'm guilty of it, by the way. Because I, I tried it the wrong way. I really, really did. And and then I figured it out later. <laughs> so, so no, I get it. And I think that sometimes there's an error that we make. We just don't understand it well. I think it's the learn by doing. And yeah. I think there's a lost generation out there. I agree. Anywhere from 26 to 33. And I've got, yeah, I might have one in there myself. That we didn't really, we weren't 
didn't give them enough attention to recognize what their gifts were to right. get everything they needed to be successful. Because how do people ask me, what should I do? I go, well, what do you love and what, right. what do you do well and what brings you joy? Yeah. Isn't this interesting, Kathy, that we sometimes don't understand what our natural gifting is? Right. I think we all have a natural gifting. There's something and we don't think of it as natural gifting because it comes so easy for us. Right. And so when things come so easy, we don't think of it as a gift, but that is your gift. And then and so what happens is we don't because we don't see it that way. We don't understand how to make that gift work and then what and then how to fulfill ourselves using that gift. And I think, you know, it's part of, you know, my job as a coach, right, is to hopefully, you know, point out and pull out of you, look, this is your natural gift. And, and this is part of, this is your passion. This is why, you know, you should be doing something with this and, and not just doing it to fulfill you, but to f- use it to fulfill others, which I think is far greater uh, part of what that our gifts are for, right, is to fulfill other people, I think, in my opinion. Well, it's, it's doing service work. I agree. Servant. Yeah, we, we are here for service. I agree. We're servant leaders, right? I mean, that's what I think. I really believe that, you know what, we're, we lead by serving. I, I'm a firm believer in leading by serving. I, I just, I know it sounds weird to the, some of the people who are probably listening or watching us on YouTube. And by the way, awesome show with Kathy. And uh, yeah, I did that for free, by the way. She didn't even know I was going to do that. I was going to do that. But anyway, no, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think people, I don't, I don't, I don't think we, you know, if you're out there, you know, look. You probably got a whole bunch of natural gifts. You you can have more than one, by the way. You don't have to have just one. You know what, folks? You know, find that thing and then you know, feel free to give it out. You know, you don't have to just make money for it for yourself. Feel free to give that out because a lot of times our cups inside of our soul are empty. You know why? Because we hoard our gifts instead of you know filling somebody else's cup fills your cup back. I, I just know that that's the truth, right? You give you give. You'll get back, I promise you. It may not be from the same person, but it's going to come from somewhere else because that's just the way life works, all right? So don't be afraid to, to if your cup is empty right now in your soul, give something away of yourself because you'll find that it'll come back to your soul. And, and it, just, it just works that way. Oh, I agree. You know, as you give, it makes room so you can receive. And, you know, I tell people, people go, well, what are my gifts? I go, what brings you joy? Right, yeah. What? You know, what do you like to do and go? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, you know, people, you know, I've, I've interviewed so many people, uh, experts on, on this whole thing of, you know, what, you know, what is, what is my gifts and what's my purpose and what's my passion and those type of things. And, you know, I tell people, you know, I, I think there's really just, it's, it's trying to make it so complicated. It's not that complicated. It really is. What are you naturally really gifted and good at, first of all? And then secondly, what is your personality? Because your personality, you, we're, we all have this personality that, you know, some of us are more extroverted, some of us are more introverted. And when we couple that natural gifting with that personality, it seems to create this passion. And then when we get that passion, then it seems to develop a purpose. And the purpose, I can tell everybody this, is that, that purpose is so much bigger than you are because it's not just about you. And I think that's the hardest thing for us to do in our world today. It, it's very difficult for us in our world today for so many people. And I feel sorry for them that they can't, that they, that they, they are so self-consumed and we have such a self-consuming society that it's hard for them to look outside of themselves because they're always concerned about themselves first. And, right. and our digital world has created that Kathy. I mean, you know, look at Instagram. Look, I've written about these things. They've given me a career. So I'm not against them. So if people are thinking I'm against Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn and Twitter, I'm not. I'm not against those at all. But if you think about it, it's all about you. Everything that you put out there, your Instagram is about you, you right? It's very rarely about somebody. Else. Absolutely. Um, but I look at those people as being very disconnected from the creator because when you're connected, you know better when you're an awakened spiritual being. So, you know, you've got the spiritual side, then you have the reptilian side. And there's many people are operating from the reptilian side only. I, you know, 
yeah, you're right. Because we, you, what the easiest thing to do is try to figure out how to survive, right? That That's the easiest thing for any of us to do in life is go, okay, I'm focused on me and I'm just going to focus on survive my survival, what's in my best interest, how I feel and how, what I want. And, and it's not even about what you need. We start focusing on what I want and how I feel. And, and then what we do is everybody else be darned, you know, it's, you're no longer important because if I, I have to, I have to take care of me first, right? Before I could take care of you. And it, I, Kathy, I think you know this too, because I've listened to your show and I, I believe that you believe this. The truth of the matter is, you know, if you step outside yourself and you start taking care of others, actually you do take care of yourself. And, it, and, and I know that you, I know that you kind of preach that message in, in sometimes very blatantly, sometimes in a roundabout way that, you know, what, what we're doing is when we are reaching out across and helping other people that what we're ultimately doing is we are helping ourselves. The fastest way to get out of depression is to help somebody else, not to wallow in your own depression. The fastest way to be successful isn't to focus on what you got to do for yourself. It's to start connecting with other people and helping them. I mean, Zig Ziglar said it best. Best. I, I I can't disagree with him, right? If you you know what, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want, right? If you help enough people get what they need, you'll get what you need. And, and I, I firmly believe it. Absolutely, it's also called um, karmic return, which. Does it mean that, like you said, you're going to get it from that person or yeah. you're going to get it right back? But if you do it enough and if you do enough service work, I mean, spirit will take care of you and you will receive everything you need. Now, it may not come from the direction you think it's going to come from, nor look like what you thought it was going to look like, but you'll get it. Yeah, I mean, the, listen, the, the farming adage is true. <laughs> I, I hate to say this to people, but it's really true. You know what? You sow what you reap. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't say it any better. The fact of the matter is, if I put corn in the field, I get corn. I don't get soybeans. If I put soybeans in the field, I get soybeans. I don't get corn. If I put if I put wheat in the field, it's not sorghum. It's wheat. It's not alfalfa. It's wheat. And it's just true in life. And that's that's why I love the farm. And and that is that. You know, the truth of the matter is, what seeds are you sowing out there today? What did you say to people? How did you treat the, how did you treat the, the young person behind the counter at the grocery store today? How did, how did you handle the guy or the lady who cut you off in traffic today? How did you deal with the fact that something went wrong in business today and it didn't go your way? You know, and then what goodness did you spread in the world today? What, what did you do to make the world a better place? And, and you know, did you start with gratitude or did you start with an attitude? Which one did you start with? Right? I, because I, and, cause I believe gratitude is attitude. And I believe that, you know, being grateful is the best thing that we can do for our, our lives and other people. I really do believe that. I believe that when we're grateful and that when we operate from an, uh, a place of gratitude, that life is better, not just for yourself, but it's better for everybody else too as well. Yeah. And when you receive, be open. Thank you is a thank you is is a tough word for people, isn't it? It is. But I tell people that if you allow someone to give to you without blocking it, right. you know, you're doing service work because now that person that's giving is open up space for spirit to give them something lovely. Yeah. Being a gracious receiver is just as important as being a gracious giver. I, I just believe that. I just believe that. I, I think sometimes we have this uh, false humility. I call it false humility. Maybe it's not. But I call it false humility where, you know, oh, no, don't do that for me. But then I go, you know, wait a second. When you give something to somebody, right, don't you want them to go, oh, thank you so much. Because you want you want them to receive your gift when you give it. So why are you going, oh no, don't do that for me? Because you know what? You're cutting them off from their from their giving, right? I mean, why would you do why would you do don't 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 ruin somebody else's blessing, kids. 
when you're <laughs> listening out there, don't do that. Accept it. Be gracious. Say thank you. I mean, if that's all you got, say thank you. It's perfect. Even if it's you're, a you're gift a... you can always re-gift it down the road. You know what I mean? I got no problems being a re-gifter. <laughs> <laughs> I got no problem with that. <laughs> all right. Now I know. Note to self. Note to right. self. Kathy, Jay is a re-gifter. I may get this gift. If I send Jay a gift, he may re-gift it back to me. Okay, yeah, I got that. Okay, good. Any, any, uh, all right, let's go back to the farm. <laughs> sure, that's why, whatever you want to go. We'll go. I'll go wherever you want to go, Kathy. I'm good. I'm, I'm really good. Uh-huh, I know. You're fun to talk to. You're absolutely right. All right, well, let's get back to the farm, sure. the farm experience. Because what about people that really can't relate to the farm, although you have said a lot of things that are in the farm and how people can relate to it in a very lovely way already. Yeah, so that's the whole book. The whole point of the book is that I really wanted to give people experiences from the farm, the, the real life experiences that I had, so that they could actually feel, taste, touch, smell, hear. I tried to create those sounds, those feelings. And then, and then what I wanted to do is not only give them that, but then what I wanted them to understand is how this lesson applies back to life in whatever you do, whether that be in your, uh, whether it be in a business or whether it be just in in general, maybe it's a relationship with a spouse or your significant other, or maybe it's your children or maybe it's your boss. I don't know. It could be that, but I wanted to find something that in that, and I looked how, how do I apply it in my own relationship? So let me just give you an example. So there is this uh, chapter in the book called One Moment Can Change Your Life Forever. And it happened to be in January 1st of 1982. And there was a cow that was giving birth. It was freezing cold in Nebraska. And she was on top of a frozen mound. And she was, she couldn't stand. The umbilical cord had wrapped around the neck of the calf and it was breech. Now, I have never delivered a calf in my life before at, at 17, 18 years old, ever, ever. I've never, I've never had to participate in that event, okay? I got a call at 6.30, 6 o'clock in the morning saying, Jay, you got to come over to the farm. We, we got a calf and the cow's down. And, and I remember Bob Lilydahl, the farmer I worked for, said, take off your jacket, roll up your sleeve, we're going to soap up your arms. Because you're going in because we got to turn this calf around. Now, now I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you've never experienced freezing cold weather of Nebraska or Michigan in the Midwest where the ground is completely frozen and you, you are being told to soap up your arms because you're about to go and try to turn a calf around inside of a cow, that's a pretty life-changing moment for you, okay? Because you're not you're not thinking at this moment when you're in that situation. All you're thinking about is saving these two animals. I'm just telling you. I didn't even think about what I was doing. I was just following this is what you got to do. And you didn't you didn't think twice about it. You didn't think you didn't think about it. And you know, we fought and fought and we got the calf finally turned around and we got we're trying to get the chains on the hooves and you're reaching and you're it's, it's slimy, and finally the calf comes out, and 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 when you have that moment where you just recognize that what happened is you helped give life to something. You you saved the life. You saved the life of not only this calf, but you say we end up saving the life of the mother, of course, too. That moment that you recognize, even as a late teenager, that you have participated in a life-changing event, not just for them, but all of a sudden you were part of that. That will change you forever. You, you can't help but being changed at that moment, and I'm so grateful for that moment. And let me tell you how it applies. I have been so fortunate, maybe unfortunate, depending on the situation, where I have literally had to save people's lives. I've had blood on other people's blood on my skin and my clothes. Didn't even know it because I responded with this thing just the same way with the cows. And that was, I didn't, it didn't matter. Those people were more important and I never panicked, never struggled because you can't panic in those situations. It's a God given uh, gift, I believe to this day, but I know it was that moment where 
folks, you got to have those moments in your life and you got to reflect back on them and understand that all of us will have some moment in our lives that changed you in a positive way to help other people. And the point is that when you have those moments, that you have to understand that you were given that moment to give back to others. And we all have them. I promise you, you have one in your life that you can look back, whether it was a family member, whether it was a near accident experience, whatever it is, I could promise you had that moment. And then what we're supposed to do with that moment is we aren't supposed to hoard it. It's not just my moment, but now it's how do I use that moment for the sake of others and improving others' lives? That's just one example. Beautiful. Now, go ahead. No, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, I, I just think that what happens is people say, well, how does a farmer, how does a farmer relate to somebody who lives in the city? And I'm like going, you know, people talk about, you know, I, you know, that, well, the farmer, the farmer has to be a veterinarian. The farmer has to be a, uh, has to, has to know entomology. A farmer has to be a mechanic. A farmer has to be a business person. He has to know the stock exchange. He has to, so he has to be a stockbroker. He has to know. Uh, he has to be his own electrician. He has to be his own mechanic. He has to, he has all these things that this farmer has to do. And so he is the CEO of a company that doesn't just supply for himself, but he's supplying for the world. And so when, and people say to me, well, I don't understand how a farmer can relate to me or my business. I always tell them, I said, well, name another CEO that literally every day has to do all these things by, by him or herself, herself, by the way, there's a lot of female farmers out there and they're fabulous farmers and, and has to do all these things by themselves and, and supplies the entire world. It's very few people, but that farmer does. So the examples from the book, I believe uh, do apply. And I believe that they apply more than just to, um, you know, like to maybe a small business, they apply to corporations, they apply to uh, even your bigger places because you can learn so much from a farmer. That's true, and you put it in the very practical terms. Um, I just want to switch a little bit and um, talk about got social mediaology. Yeah. Everybody has hoof and mouth disease online. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, DFMD, digital foot and mouth disease. Yeah, that was, uh, thank you, Richard Kuritz, for coming up with that term for me, um, which is fabulous. So let's talk about what social mediology is first. Social mediology is a term I created, which is the study of social media from the psychological perspective of the user and the social psychological perspective of each platform. Uh, understanding each platform as a unique culture with its own unwritten rules, norms, expectations, and language. So... When we, when I created, when I did the research to write that first book, at social mediaology, I became a social mediologist, one who studies the people who interact in these environments, and I was trying to find a way for businesses and people to interact in these environments without having to spend absurd amounts of money on marketing. So the problem is, is that we get ourselves in a lot of trouble on social media. And the reason why we get in trouble with social media is because there is this, there's this uh, little psychological thing that we started to understand called online dis disinhibition effect. And online disinhibition effect means that anytime we're behind a, a phone, you know, something that looks like this, a phone, anytime we're behind a phone or we're behind a computer or a laptop or whatever, we are less inhibited. So we will say things and do things behind those, those instruments than we would ever do in person. Let me give an example. Ladies and gentlemen, you know this is true. You all know this is true. How many of you would call up 500 of your so-called friends that you call friends, but they're really acquaintances, most of them. How many would call them up and say, hey, Come on over to the house or the apartment because I just bought a brand new bathing suit and I am going to shoot a picture of myself in the bathroom in a mirror. Now, how many of you people would call that call your friends up and actually have them come to your house to do that? You know what the answer is? None of you. 
Okay, maybe a couple of you, but (laughs) most likely none of you would ever do because we wouldn't do that. But we'll do it online, right? There's a toilet in the background. We all see it, okay? There's a toilet in the background when you're in your lingerie and your bathing suit and you're in your bathroom in a mirror. We know it's your bathroom. You didn't just submit it to your 500 closest friends. Everybody can see it. You submitted it to the world. Here's a better idea. Why don't you just get a big blowhorn and just announce to the world, new bathing suit, new piece of lingerie, come on over, shooting a picture. Take a look. See me live. Well, because that's what you just did. Right? So, <laughs> I mean, okay, I know it's so absurd, but it's so funny. It's so true. I'm laughing at my own stuff. What can I say? It's, you know, it's like 1230 in the morning. So what, what am I going to say? Anyway, so we do that. But then there's the other thing we do, right? We say things that we would never say, right? We say we say stuff that we would never say in person. Well, we have no more filter, but I have to say, though, my inhibitions have totally gone. When I go on Twitter, <laughs> Trump shows up. I mean, oh, my God, I would not ever say what I have ever said to any other president on earth. I mean, and, you know, I go, like, oh, my God, I'm actually saying this, but yeah, it's perfect, you know? God. Uh, yeah, filter when it comes to Trump. But I wouldn't do that mm, in my real life. <laughs> no, it's it's true. It, it You know, it's true, right? And you and I, you and I both do radio. In I mean, my real life, I'm a gentle <laughs> 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 Oh, that's so funny. We, you know, you, warrior goddess. Okay. okay. <laughs> Complicated, right? Complicated. It, yeah. Well, th- that's why uh, I think the the, the uh, psychologist who actually invented this term, the online disinhibition effect, was uh, Dr. Uh, Suler, and he was the one who created it and really started to study that. Uh, people once they get behind something like these in these digital environments, once they get behind a phone or a laptop, or whatever, or their tablet, what what happens is they we just don't we just don't filter ourselves. We're willing to say things that we would never say in person. We're willing to, to to shoot pictures of ourselves that we would never be willing to do, and it's because we feel so safe behind the screen because nobody can actually. We can't we can't get an interaction, right? We can't see an emotional reaction to anybody. We may get some and the only people who tend to react to something that we do online generally like us anyway. So it's like we've created our own little ecological place that we're you know, that we just get supported so we don't even get any negative feedback. And if we do, you know, then all of a sudden we get more angry than we would if we were in person. So the dialogue is gone. And now we're, now we're calling people idiots. And so the next thing you know, here, okay, you want to know how big the foot gets in your mouth? It's huge. That's what happens. I've learned to block really quick. <laughs> <laughs> now, if people get what I'm putting out for, they don't. I don't have time to argue or go off the tangent because you don't get me. Right. Or you're a supporter. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's it's so funny. I just find it. Obviously, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm sure you got that one. I, I, you, know, you know what? Listen, I'm an anti-politics guy, period. I hate politics. My dad was so politically involved. And what typically happens is when your parent is so typically politically involved, you become the very opposite thing. So my dad was uh he was consumed by politics uh, it was his passion and he loved it but it became such a it became such a consuming thing for him i just didn't want to have a part of it and so i just stay away from it you know it doesn't matter what your parents did that's what the kids did i had a healing center rock shop you think my kids wanted rocks for christmas no mm. Mm. You know, not- do, you think, do you think they think i'm not crazy to this day <laughs> Just a little bit. Okay. How's that working out for you, Kathy? <laughs> well, my thirty-year-old finally came around. The two, you know, they're they're coming around. You know, they they're finally getting me. Yay! Um, <laughs> but, you know, nobody wants to go into the rock business. Nobody wants to become a healer like I am. But they're very grateful for right. what I do. Sure. They all sure. have their own lives. And that's awesome. We have children and their arrows. You shoot them off in their direction. 
to go be independent, successful, and happy. You know, if you don't want to do what I do, nor live in Hawaii, okay, you know. (laughs) Yeah, how how bad can Hawaii be? I mean, really. It's awful. I mean, really, people. It's overcrowded. That's a shame. Got to fight with kayaking. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. You got to fight. I'm a healing center. Come on out, y'all guys. And we're just kidding. You know, it's an incredible place to be. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. It's, I've never been, it's one, it's on my bucket list to go to Hawaii. I've never been to Hawaii and it's on well, my bucket list. If you ever make it, I'll take you kayaking. Love to. Swimming. Oh, absolutely. Give me a reason to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd love, I'd love to. I'm, I'm, I'm big fit. I'm a big into fitness and doing all sorts of fun things. So yeah, let's do that. It would be great to do that. So, you know, I got to tell you this whole social media thing. This, I, I want to go back to that real quick because there's something else that just popped in my head. Yeah, that happens. Don't know why. It just pops in. So it was. I call it the pop in, ladies and gentlemen. It's the pop in. This just in. This just in. One of the things that occurs for us on social media is that we have a tendency, and I believe this is why we've deteriorated so much within our society in terms of dialogue and communication because we no longer have face-to-face conversations and all of our conversations are being held online we no longer can have what i would call healthy discourse meaning that we can't have a healthy discussion and being on opposite ends of a spectrum and i believe that art has been lost largely because we spend all our time, digital, so much of our time in digital environments or texting back and forth, and we lose the physical, emotional um, piece of ourselves that we read each other. And we also reduce the hostility between each other because once we are face-to-face and we do have those conversations, those conversations actually can help us grow and learn about each other. And what we've done sadly in these social media environments is we've stopped learning about each other. We stopped looking at the other side of the argument. We stopped looking at um, another person's opinion. And what we've done is uh, sadly, I feel like what I'm, what I'm seeing is, is that people will just reject somebody because, well, you voted on that side or you voted on this side, whatever it is. I don't care. To me, some involved in politics I see it and it makes me sad in my heart because I don't think the way somebody votes should disqualify them as a human being. And so I feel that social media has done a real disservice in that aspect in that we have not uh, done a very good job at teaching people how to have real conversations that lead to real productive um, relationships that are real relationships. Because um, I think it's important that we have people who are not like ourselves. Because I think that's what diversity is. I think diversity isn't about a color. It's not just about a color. It's about different viewpoints. It's about different ages. It's about different genders. And so I, I feel like we've done a real disservice because we tend to be locked into our own groups in social media. And so we are no longer diverse as we used to be. In fact, what we are is I think we've become our own little little niches where we have our own people. And that's just kind of my sad, but yet truthful opinion on what's going on with social media. Can't argue about that. Well, I, I wasn't looking for an argument. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Ah, just teasing. Words, I, am right. teasing, I am teasing you. I'm poking you a little bit just to, just to tease you a little bit. Cause it's, I, you are so easy to talk to. Do you know that? You are just like, and of course I have a gift for Gab. I get it because that's my natural gifting. But I mean, you are so easy to talk to. I mean, you, you're fun. I'm it's like, Midwest, I told you this. <laughs> I feel like, okay, should I be on a couch? Do I need to pay you for this session? I mean, if I feel. <laughs> I'm on the humility program. That's okay. <laughs> it's all donations. Uh, you are precious. You are so precious. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Good for you. But yeah, um, so what would you say um, that people should do so they don't get foot and mouth? Yeah. 
tell you in all honesty with what you said that I honestly, if I'm on social media and if someone is a Trump supporter and I'm getting back to Trump, yeah. to me, you're a downright racist. And I really, you know, you're, I'm not going to be able to communicate with you. There's, you're not connected yet. Right. So I have to go about it a different way, nor do I want you to come in anymore and see what I do so you can negate my energy work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I do hear okay. what you're saying. I do. And I have to put it out in public, right. but I can weed out those people that pop up there and make it obvious that are going and are trying to destroy my work and make it harder to manifest light and quantum leaping the world into enlightenment. You know what I mean? It's hard enough out there without you know those people rapping on you when you don't have to go there to begin with so Diana. <laughs> okay so so i have a rule of thumb i teach this to uh, college athletes and professional athletes as well when i talk to them and you, you're talking about what i call trolls uh flamers and shamers right so we have these three groups right trolls flamers and shamers trolls are people who are trying to troll you and they're trying to pick on you, and, and they're, they're trying to get you to say something stupid. That's a troll. Flamers are those people who try to provoke you to getting really angry and doing something. And then shamers, what they do is they try to embarrass you on some level so that um, then they want to shut you down, right? So I call them trolls, flamers, and shamers. So here's what I've learned about those three groups. There's, there is one way to stop all of it. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Write this down. If you don't feed a troll, they die. I know your temptation is to want to respond. I know that that is your temptation. I know that you want to respond to them. If you, <laughs> if you want, if you want, you can see what Kathy's doing. I know we're gonna, This is going to be a podcast. If you can see what Kathy is doing, she's she's squashing trolls right now. So, but anyway, I'm blocking. Okay? She's blocking. I know she's blocking. I, I ignore them. If you ignore them and ignore anything they say and you just move on, can I just tell you something? They go away. Because here's what's going to happen. On how early it is when I see this stuff, okay? Yeah, no. But you know what the problem is when you block them? Here's the problem when you block them. Let me tell you what trolls do when you block them. They create another account. They create another account so that they can come back and find you in a different way. And so when you ignore them, when you ignore them, don't block them, what happens is you take away all their firepower because then they're like, it's, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like the, I remember in grad school, when I was in graduate school in psychology, we were working, you know, we had a lab because I was one of Skinner's, I studied under B.F. Skinner's last student, uh, was one of my th folks, and folks work in the wet rat lab, right? And you know what happens when the, the pigeon or the rat doesn't get reinforcement? They peck, 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 and then the pecking slows down because what happens is they recognize that they're not getting the reinforcement. Reinforcement is really when we respond back to them. So don't reinforce them because that's what they want. They want you to res respond to them. Don't do that if you stop beating them. The other thing that I tell people. <laughs> block, block, block. I'm not responding. I, we just, <laughs> yes. The, the other thing. Go away. Yeah, You're go. Gone. I know. But they're not, they're going to, I mean, you, you know, you throw yourself out there. It's what's going to happen. But here's the other thing. Other thing to do is I, I always tell people, um, there's three rules. I call it win W I N, right? First one is whatever you post, the W stands for, what would your grandmother think? <laughs> no, serious. What would your grandmother think? I mean, is this something that if you post this, what would your grandmother think if you posted this? Right. That's Polish. You know, she'd probably yeah. tell me. Go for it, woman. But okay, fine. So then you're in, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in with Graham, okay? <laughs> right, right. And then the I, the the I is for, you know, what what's that intensity? Is that it's that emotional intensity? Is it too intense? Right? Is there too much emotional intensity? Right? And and so we maybe you need to cut back the emotional intensity. And then the N stands for need. Do I need to do this now? Right. So, you know, then you ask a question, and if you wait 30 seconds, here's what I tell people. If you will wait 30 seconds before you hit post, guess what will happen? Chances are 
somewhere between 25 and 50% of the posts you would never post. If you just wait 30 seconds before you hit it. Now, Kathy's looking at me going, oh, no, Jay, you don't know me. I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing here. Those babies are going out. <laughs> and, and Kathy, okay, good for you. That's awesome. Good for you. But, I, you know, for most people, you know, especially, you know, Kathy and I own our own business. And so we're very fortunate to be able to do that. And, you know, so we give a little bit more flexibility. But for those of you who are working in a company where they're paying attention to your social media, certainly you have to pay much more closer attention to what you're doing because this we've seen it. I've seen it over and over again. People lose their jobs because of the things that they're posting on social media. So uh, be you do need to be careful. Yeah, you need to be careful. I mean, you you and I are in a unique position, let's be honest. We're in a different league, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I don't know if it's a league, but we're in a way different position for sure, yeah. We are, um, and, you know, we're out there – doing what we're here and doing our mission. Sure. Yeah. And when you know what your mission is, you don't let people get in your way. I I totally could not agree more. Kathy could not agree more. I, I see I love are you people listening to the show Quantum Leap? You should be listening to the show. Are you listening to this regularly? Because this is a show. This is a great show. You need to listen to Quantum Leap. It's awesome. Hugs. <laughs> <laughs> Back at you. All, all six feet, four, yeah, all six feet, four inches of me hugging you back. Oh my God, he's tall. Okay, um, so people want to get a hold of you to do yeah. work, which I mean, they really should because you're so easy to work with. <laughs> well, thank you. Hey, listen, if you want to get a hold of me, there are so many ways. First of all, I'm on every social media platform. My name is spelled J A Y I Z S O. Okay, I Z S O. So think of Zsa Zsa Gabor, which was Z S A Z S A. Well, mine Z S O Z S O. So I Z S O is my Dad name. Hates you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do what I do. I'm Hungarian. What do you want? I'm I'm full blooded Hungarian. That's how it's spelled. Zsa Zsa was Hungarian. We're the same. So, <laughs> also, you can <laughs> you can go to jizzo.com. You can also find me. My I'm the only registered trademark as the Internet Doctor in the world. So if you see that R with a circle around it, you know that that's me. Also, you can uh, go to Amazon. Just look up Lessons from the Farm, Essential Rules for Success, Got Social Mediology, the Social Media Playbook for Student Athletes, the Social Media Playbook for Coaches and Administrators. I'm all over the place. And tune in. I have a show, too. I interview best-selling authors from all over the world on help you finding a new direction in life, business, and career. It's called A New Direction, and it's available iHeartRadio and all over. So feel free to chime in there, too. Um, would you give your book? Yeah, I've got friends that are, um, athletes. Yeah. So what would they take from your book? Yeah, the student athlete book and the coaches books. Yeah. So I just really point out that there are better ways to do this. I, I, I call, I tell athletes when I speak to college athletes, pro athletes, or even high school athletes, I tell them, you know, there are like a playbook, you have plays for offense and you have plays for defense. And you want to play um, you want to play on the offensive side of social media, meaning that do things that put you in a positive light and for your future. One of the worst things that can happen to you as an athlete is first of all, you have a stage that no one else has. So you need to use that stage because you've been given a gift to be an athlete. And that athletic gift is unique to you. And so use that stage because that's the that that for positive things, for good things. So there's some plays that you play on offense, for instance. You know, all of you travel, all of you athletes travel. Why don't you let people into that world of what it's like to travel as an athlete? That is an offensive play, right? That's a pl- that's a play that you play offense, right? You know, if you have a team meal, what is a team meal really like? What do you eat the day of a game? People want to know those things. Show them. This is what this is what we do, right? How do you prepare, right? Take those pictures. Show those photos. Those are playing offense, right? And they're safe, and they endear you to people. And if you have a family, don't be afraid of showing your family. Don't be afraid of showing that support. That support is important for people to see that 
you have this, you have, you have family and, and, you know, be real in that aspect of yourselves. Playing defense means that you've gotten in trouble. Now, what do I do? Right? So how do you play defense? Well, I'll just give you a couple things. First of all, you don't have to shut down your count. That's not always a thing, but sometimes what you do is you just have to take a break and be done for a while because time has a way of, you know, kind of dismantling the wounds. So maybe you just take, just shut, don't shut, don't delete the profile, but maybe you just shut it down for a while and just say, Hey, you know what? Season's on. I'll be back. I'll be back, you know, sometime soon. So I, I tell athletes to think about how you would play offense or how you would play defense and, and keep themselves safe so that not only if you're a young person, let's say in high school and college, and you want to have a career outside of sports, because the better you are in social media, the better chances you are going to have a career. Because everybody is looking for, for young people to have really good social media because you are going to become the marketing person for that company that you're working with. If you're a professional athlete, the thing I'm going to tell you as a pro athlete is you, by doing social media right, you become an endorser for products in your future. And I can't tell you how many millions of dollars you may be missing out by saying the wrong things on social media. Gosh, I hate to say it, but we've run out of time. What? I know. Fast or ever. <laughs> <laughs> you are awesome. You're so awesome. You're going to have to trade me out for one of your books, all right? All right, I will. You know what? I'll send you some books. How about if I send you, how about if I send you one of all of my books? All right, only because Richard didn't do it. I will send you my address and all that good stuff. Guys, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on, Jay. This is Kathy Bilski, the Quantum Leap Let Light Unite show on UPR and radio. And this is Friday, August 16th, 2019. And see you next week, guys. Same time. Aloha. Night, Jay. Ciao.